Welcome back to X-Men Classic. This is episode 30. In this episode, we're going over issues 64 to 66, the final issues of the classic era of Uncanny X-Men. First up, issue 64, which is the introduction to the character Sunfire. And this issue, I should also note, this issue was adapted into an episode of Spider-Man's Amazing Friends, where they kept Iceman in here. But pretty much the X-Men were replaced by Sunfire, by uh, Firestar and uh, Spider-Man. And the issue is called The Coming of Starfire and Sunfire. I should note that this issue uh, is not done by Neil Adams. This issue's artwork is done by uh, Don Heck. who This is actually his last issue he ever does. Yeah, Don Heck's last issue was the artist... Uh, for uh, Candy X-Men. Yep. This is his last issue. The next issue is the last one featuring Neil Adams. And of course you have Sal Bushman doing the last issue ever. The issue opens up with Sunfire. Just flying around. Now this is a really interesting issue. And I'll, I'll get to the reason why. So basically we cut away to basically after a whole thing back Neo, uh, with the previous issue. Everyone goes back to New York. And... I was like doing fine, and of course everything's like calmed down. And of course, Sunfire comes in, uh, comes to the plaza, and like they case a new statue, and then um, says and calls this guy, this this Japanese. I think it's supposed to be the Japanese representative. Uh, and what does Sunfire do? This new statue, he burns it. Yep, he melts the statue. Like, like he's some kind of traitor or something like that. And of course, the X come out and fight Sunfire for a brief bit. It's just um, Iceman, Angel, and Beast. Gene, Gene and uh, Scott basically are just at, just at their apartment. And it turns, and basically, now, in case you're wondering, Sunfire is not the main villain of this issue. The main villain of this issue is this guy, um, who is Sunfire's uncle. Yeah, this guy here who is standing, who's standing behind. The sitting star sunfire, yeah, he's the main villain of this issue because he's sort of like very upset because what happened in World War II. So yeah, you can kind of see this issue as sort of a I don't know something to deal with the the bombing of Hiroshima and of course because um, the whole thing with radiation. Basically, you kind of have. Um, Uh, basically, you have a flashback kind of deal with uh, Sunfire's origin story of how he got his powers awakened, where he's like near the the um, near the ruins of Hiroshima, and he somehow touches like infected radiation and he just activates his powers, and his uncle sort of just manipulates him, and he says he must wear ancient colors, and of course he trains on how to use the powers, and then um. Cyclops doing like whatever, like fly around their car, and they try and the X-Men are searching for Sunfire here, what the heck he is, and and flying on the plane, stuff like that, and we cut away to the, uh, of course the beginning of the issue took place in New York City, now we're in D.C., where, where the, this guy, I don't remember his name, says, uncle, says, remember the, today, says, today the soft and decent Shall tremble as Lady Dick is with her symbol of the rising sun. It says, What kind of unreasoned treason do you speak? And he's like, What? And it turns out the diplomat he uh, sort of attacked before was actually his father. Yep, it's his father. Yep. It's something the Japanese do. I have no idea why he decided to slap him for. Yeah. And of course, uh, Gene and Six Scott spot Sunfire's father, who is um, Saburo Yoshida, I think it's his name. Yeah, they spot him like in the crowd because they remember him from New York. And of course, uh, um, he finds out that uh, his son is Sunfire. He's thinking like he disgraced his country. He says he does this for his country. He's just too old and soft. And 
and he just flies around. He just he's so he's so he's so confused after he knocks out his father. So he just um goes flying around top of the nation's capital, gets in a fight with uh with both Iceman and um, Angel. Pretty much, he just spends a majority of the issue just fighting the X Men until uh, somehow until uh, he wakes up and just says the guy's name is Tomo. Yeah, that, that, that's the guy's name, Tomo. And uh, he, he sees that what Tomo is doing, he's manipulating him, so he try, tried to get him turned against him. So what does Tomo do? Sh shoots the father. Yeah, he, he shoots uh, Sunfire's father. Falls off. He does kind of save him in the way. But the issue ends kind of somberly, where uh, the Japanese diplomat uh, dies. And of course, everybody just walks away. And of course, some Sunfire is grieving over his father's death. It's a nice little issue. I'll review my final thoughts later, uh, what I think of this issue. Now we cut to uh, Kenny X Men 65, which is the last issue the new Adams draws. And I saw also note that this is the this is the earliest collaboration of Neil Adams and his writer frequent co-writer f frequent writer who works with him, Danny O'Neill. Yep, this is Danny O'Neill's one of his earliest works he ever did. Uh, not the earliest work, one of his earliest works he ever did. Um, yeah, Slays of the Star Spawn. Yep, and then the issue opens up with. Havoc and Polaris basically act like complete jerks to the rest of the X-Men. Yeah, basically they had just come back from battling Sunfire, and they want to come inside. Of course, they're being forced to come inside. Everyone's like, "What the heck are you talking about?" I was like, "Everyone's like so angry," and they have a right to. Like, they have no idea what they're talking about. And this kind of goes on back and forth for several pages. Like, what the heck is that? And it turns out some alien. And of course, they hear him out, and then we turns and it turns out that, uh, like, he explains exactly what these aliens are, what they're doing. Says he, Scott thinks he's lying about the whole thing, and it turns out the person who was basically put together this plan to take him on was Charles Xavier. Yep. Da da da. Yeah, he's alive. Yep. And explains what the heck he's been up to. I mean, everyone thought he died back in issue 42, which at this point had been almost two years prior. Now, some of you are thinking, I thought Charles Xavier died battling Duo Tesk. Well, he explains what the heck was going on. Apparently, after the events of issue 38, apparently the, the guy I know is Changeling. Uh, came to him basically. He just got six months to live because of shape shifting powers. So he decides to um, shape shift into Xavier, basically, just sort of fake his death while he deals with the whole invasion. So he shape shifts into him, which apparently is killing him. And of course, he was the one who actually died battling grotesque. Yep, it was Changeling who died, not Charles Xavier. So a, a one shot villain. Pose as Charles Xavier for a few issues before he dies. So he poses him starting with issue 38 up until issue 42. So it was him who died in issue uh, 42, not Charles Xavier. So after he explains everything was going on, like what, what what was going on, so they get some training going on, and then we cut away to the helicarrier. Yeah, it's a helicarrier. Yeah, this big, huge thing is a helicarrier. Thank you, Neil Adams, for drawing that thing. And, of course, we see that uh, some people are... Uh, the, uh, the helicarrier is headquarters for S.H.I.E.L.D. x some from training, get some Zox robots. And, of course, they go off into space, take on the Zox, take on their ships, take on the giant creature. Yeah, it's a big alien invasion story. That's simply what this issue is. And, of course, we um, see some people talking to them. Uh, big up whatever the heck is going on. Of course, the Zach just, and of course the X-Men just fighting them back and forth. Yeah, pretty much this whole issue is the X-Men fighting a group of aliens the first time. They're just fighting, they head back an alien base, and we see some flashes of several people, like the, some various people, including the Fantastic Four. Yeah, because Charles Xavier sort of having a telepathic conference with the whole planet, 
uh, just trying to figure out what the heck is going on. Just tell him what's going on. And of course, the axe take on the Zox. And of course, I think this is supposed to be uh, Franklin Summers, who is um, Re Re Sue Richard's son. Everyone's like very, uh, very like getting some positive feed feedback to the X-Men. Just keep fighting, 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 and then they defeat the Zox and get away. And the issue ends with Xavier collapsing, and I think that should like they have to go find. They have to. Um, yeah, the they they defeat the Zox, and then it says and the issue ends with next. The Hulk. Now the Zox do return many years later at the end of uh, Howard Mankey's run for Amazing Spider-Man as sort of a prelude to maximum security. So they're gone for almost 40 years, for a little over 30 years. Yeah. And yes, in issue 66, the final issue of the, of the classic era, they take on the Hulk. Yep, the Hulk. Now... Roy Thomas, this is Roy Thomas' last issue for the series that he wrote, and this is the only issue uh, Sal Bushma wrote, uh, drew for the whole series. You might notice that by the change of artwork. From the awesome New Adams to Sal Bushma. I'm not really a big fan of his artwork. It's very... It's just different. I'm just not really a big fan. Just, it just feels different after the shift of having the awesome Neil Adams do all this great artwork. And we get Sal Bushma. Nothing against the guy. I just, I'm a really big fan of his artwork. His, I would say his worst artwork he's ever done was, uh, a lot of people might agree with me on this, is when he was the artist for the Spider-Man books in the 90s. His artwork was really, really bad then. But this is his early work, so I'm not going to have to criticize it. And of course, uh, because they have to go find, um, figure out how to figure out how to cure the X-Men. And of course, Iceman gets upset because Havoc is touching Polaris. And of course, they get into a brief fight. And Cyclops like, knock it off, you two. Yeah. And in case you're wondering, this is an on and off fight between these two for the next 40 years. I am not kidding. Iceman and Havoc fight each other for years over Lorna Dane, Magneto's daughter. They fight each other over this woman, this gorgeous woman, who, of course, had broke up with Havoc for the last time in the pages of Peter David X Factor toward the end of his run. Yep. Like, trying to comfort her, he's like, oh, touch his girl. Yeah. Cyclops is like, come on, knock I look like school children. So, yeah, they... Um, so they use some something similar to pen particles, like try to enhance Charles Xavier's brain. Says, "Tell him to go look for the Hulk," and they say, "Yeah, look, go find the Hulk." You must see the Hulk for some reason. And they fly out and they find the Hulk, and he just walking around some random city. Yep, he just walking around some random city. Uh, yeah, it's it's uh it's Las Vegas, not some random city. I was trying to look at that. Yeah. And so he just fights the X-Men for a few pages. They just fight the X-Men. Of course, they get so try to get called away by Glenn Talbot. Yep, Major Talbot, who, by the way, is dead now. Yep, he got killed off. Um, I don't know. I think it was like the 90s they killed him off. Oh, I remember now. Uh, he died in the 80s uh, flying a war wagon over Japan, and he died there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's where he died. He's dead now. So you have to worry about him being around. But he's in the Marvel Cinematic Universe now, so I have to mention that too. Of course, in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, he's a, he's a one-star general. Yep. And of course, they tell the action to back off. And it tells the answer to Dr. Banner. Of course, they... Dr. Banner remembers Charles Xavier. After a while, his memory is coming to him. And so he tries to take the and tries to take him away. Uh, and of course, Talbot's like, no, so he sticks the army on them, and Bruce turns back into the Hulk. And the Hulk takes on the army, beats up their tanks. Yeah, it kind of feels like 
yeah, even though the Hulk is guest starring this issue, kind of advances the Hulk spot a little bit. So, yeah, of course the X-Men get away. Hulk gets away, then the X-Men gets away. And then they find him some more. And they and they, and they go to uh, Bruce Banner's, uh, one of his secret labs. Yeah, one of his secret labs. And the X-Men again will we'll look for some sort of device to help Xavier. And they do, and they find the, they find the device, and they use it on Charles Xavier to fix him. And he's fine. Yep, he's fine. The issue ends kind of nicely, in a way. Yeah, it repairs his brain, uh, basically he's recovering from it. So, it's a nice ending to this era. Not nice ending to this issue. And it's an okay in issue to end the era. So, what do I think of these three issues? Uh, 64, great introduction to Sunfire. Really, really interesting story. Uh, to reference uh, the whole thing with uh, they, I think the reason why Roy Thomas created Sunfire because they wanted because he wanted a mutant who was not uh, he wanted to create a particular mutant who basically uh, his nationality was part of his character which was Sunfire which is Japanese and missing other thing with Hiroshima stuff like that and I think at this point when he was introduced it had been about 25 years since the end of World War II so he probably wanted to do something to sort of have a nod to World War II, so sort of um, honoring World War II in a way, basically mentioning Hiroshima, and basically that's how uh, Sunfire gets his powers. He's still a mutant, but basically being exposed to the radiation that was left from Hiroshima, that activated mutant gene. So that's a nice issue. I give that one a 9 out of 10. It's a really good issue. 65. Wow, really good issue. Didn't like the fact that... Um, Havoc and Polaris basically were jerks throughout half of the issue until Charles Xavier showed up. I got hand it to Denny and they'll bring back Charles Xavier. That was a really brilliant stroke of genius in retconning issue. Uh, basically, him being alive basically also retcons Charles Xavier's appearances from issues uh, 38 to 42. Those five issues were retconned to having Changeling being Charles Xavier all along. Yeah, that was just a retcon. Uh... Really nice issue, kind of standalone-ish, but it does the ending kind of does lead to the following issue, which ends the era, and introducing a new new threat, the Sox. Really good. Um, yeah, it's kind of like a like I said, an invasion story, alien invasion story, and this is the first time that there's been sort of a full blown invasion in Marvel Comics at this point because well, yeah. As the final issue, just features the Hulk. Yeah. Goes out for the Hulk. First time the X never met the Hulk, and they just find him first. They they find for most of the issue, while also dealing with Glenn Talbot, a supporting character of the Incredible Hulk. Now the Incredible Hulk at this point, I think had just gotten back his ongoing series. So this just sort of, I guess you can kind of see this issue was sort of a promotion for uh, an advertisement for the Incredible Hulk series, which by the way was still publishing. Uh, had, had just come back at this point. So it back for about maybe about a year or two at this point. Nice little issue. Um, yeah, and I give that particular issue a... Uh, because the fact it's, it's it's a nice issue in the NC era, I give it 8.5 out of 10. Um, for 65, I give that one a 9 out of 10. Because it's Eddie O'Neill. Despite the whole thing with with Havoc and Polaris acting like complete jerks of half the issue. But I guess Denny O'Neill just happened to jump in at the last minute. Something like that. Some might think of uh, issue 65 as Philip. I guess it's not written by Roy Thomas. But it does play into the events of what happens in the following issue. Um, so these issues are actually just standalone issues. Very loosely connected. Um, very nice issues in a way. So. And. What happens at the end of issue 66 is brought up a couple times exactly what happens next. Um, basically, there's a couple books you can kind of say that kind of say, yeah, we pick up like right where this issue legs off. The first, of course, is the uh, backup story from X-Men uh, Volume 2, number 93, which is sort of a backdoor power to the X-Men 15 years series. And, of course, you also have Savage, the first four issues of Savage Hulk, Done, uh, written and drawn by Alan Davis. The guy is a good artist, but not that good of a writer. So, it's your prerogative, but I prefer the X-Men Hidden Years as sort of a continuation of the X-Men at this point over Savage Hulk, because that came first. 
Um, the next episode I'm going to do is going to be start of the Spotlight Era, which will happen over the course of happened over the course from 1970 to 1975. I will cover stuff. Hopefully, cover stuff like uh, Amazing Adventures, which is where Beast shows up, an issue of Marvel Team Up. Basically, anything usually Spotlight related, I probably will mention. Or at least sh or at least talk about here. The other thing I probably will not talk about is, uh, I will mention this uh, in the final issue of Shaun of the She Devil. Uh, Charles Xavier makes a cameo in, in the final issue of the series. Yeah, so that's a little reference there. Uh, Cyclops Gene and Professor Xavier cameo in another book. I don't know which one it was, but I'll probably look it up later when I talk about the spotlight stuff. But overall, the classic era was actually really interesting to read. A bit, uh, it had some up and down, so the whole but and the reason why I decided to start talk about these first, or starting with the Chris Claremont era, because where do you think those characters came from? Where do you think the original five X Men, Magneto, Blob, all these other characters came from? Even the Juggernaut. Where do you think these characters came from? Like, there, there are issues in there that reference these issues right here. I just reviewed these past sixty six issues, but. Uh, yeah, that's it uh, for the classic era, and that's it for this episode. Uh, stay tuned to the next episode, which will be the start of the spotlight era for the Kenny X-Men. For the X-Men. So until then, see you there. Bye.